Okay, we're live. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are here today um, at our next guest speaker talk um, for this month of July. Um, before I get into the talk itself, uh, just a couple of um, announcements and just a bit of an introduction of our club. Uh, we are based in San Jose, uh, San Jose Astronomical Association. Uh, we have been around for many, many years. Um, and we have been, always been a very active club, but given the, the whole COVID situation, we are now actively trying to take our presence online. And that's where we are coming from right now, where we are trying to um, do these events that we used to do at our base camp in, in, in San Jose um, virtually and bring them to you over YouTube now and hopefully reach more audience that way because it's, it's now you can, anyone in the world can join us from anywhere. Uh, so a few events that we have done so far is uh, our star parties are now online. Uh, we just did one yesterday. Uh, it was great. Uh, our astronomers put on a great show for two and a half hours, and uh, we actually showed you life objects um, from the sky um, sitting in your armchair, which is why we call it Armchair Star Party. Also, uh, we have done solar viewing that way, which we used to do again at Hoogie Park once a month. And unfortunately, some other programs, such as our Fixit program, which helps you uh, bring in your telescope if you need any help with that, or, or a loaner program where you get to loan the equipment, uh, are currently on hold. But hopefully, with the restrictions lifting, uh, maybe we'll be able to go back to it soon. Um, but this is an attempt uh, to do our best to reach, continue the outreach, which is the main mission of SGA. Uh, so if you have any feedback, any questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. Uh, I will type up the links in the chat channel very, very soon. Uh, you can use to reach to us um, and just, just, you can take it from there. And of course, there will be some membership information as well. If you go to our website, uh, it's just $20 per year. Per year. Uh, so as Wolf apparently, one of our directors uh, likes to say, it's just one price, one pizza <laughs> like cost of a pizza so you can definitely consider joining us as a member if that's something interests you uh, now coming to our talk for today uh, we are very fortunate to have a speaker who has given us a great talk before uh, jr scock he's a planetary scientist working at SETI, and i think his his life he seems to be dedicated to Mars. <laughs> as, as, as long as I have known JR, I think he has been re really passionate about it and has been working on this uh, Perseverance rover uh, that he will be telling us more about today. Uh, so without further ado, I would ask JR to start uh, his presentation. Okay. Thank you, JR. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I look forward mm -hmm. to sharing uh, some of my insight with the uh, Perseverance rover that's going to be launching hopefully at the end of this month, um, due to some challenges with the, um, some last minute engineering, it has been slipping a little bit, but the current launch date was at the end of July um, to get to Mars. So, um, you know, we're starting off with this initial kind of slide. This is an image I love from Mar uh, NASA's created, the evolution of a Martian, showing from the Pathfinder uh, rover all the way in the, um, the small rover on the side uh, that landed on Mars in 1997. Um, the two uh, Spirit and Opportunity rovers that came in 2004 and um, you know, kept us, uh, taught us about water on Mars. I was fortunate enough to work on the camera team for both of those missions, um, turning uh, grayscale color image, uh, grayscale images of the surface into color panoramas and other uh, kind of visual products. The Curiosity and then um, Perseverance rover are these two much larger rovers. And hopefully someday we can look forward to having these human footsteps on Mars. So um, after working on the camera team for the two um, Spirit and Opportunity rovers during my undergrad experience at Cornell, um, I went and as a graduate student started working on um, a Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, looking at data images of the surface of Mars. 
And um, a lot of that was looking at landing sites for both curiosity and later on for perseverance. So a lot of the talk I'll go to be uh, mentioning today is my experience trying to propose landing sites for these rovers, where they should land and what they're gonna do. And some insights on why we're actually sending these missions to Mars. So a little outline of the talk, we'll talk about what's gonna be coming up this year. Um, then a bit longer, a, a history of Mars exploration. What do we know? What's the context? Why are we exploring the way we are based on what's happened before? Uh, then we're gonna go back in time to understand just why this mission's happening um, to the 2010 Decadal Survey and how that led to uh, decisions that are um, leading to the mission now. Uh, talk a bit more about the Mars Sample Return Program, what it is, how it's gonna work. And then finally, um, a bit about the Perseverance rover that's launching this month and what you should expect from watching that mission over the next few years. So uh, first, why are we launching now? You know, what is um, uh, this month, July, especially so important? So it turns out because of the orbits of Earth and Mars, every about two, two and a half years, the planets kind of align on the same side of the sun for these close approaches. And so we see the, um, this one, this uh, map here kind of was focused on the last um, close approach from 2018, this kind of um, uh, the orange uh, circle there is a kind of close approach about 57 million kilometers apart back in 2018 when we launched the InSight mission. The um, approach now is just a little bit farther apart than those, 62 uh, million kilometers, but still pretty close um, for these close approaches. So. NASA and a bunch of nations, they try to have their launches happen when these kind of close approaches windows occur. And so that's what's happening now and why there's kind of a, a, mar um, a fleet of missions heading to Mars uh, this month. And we see that the close approach is actually October 6th. So in order, it takes about eight months or so for the current rockets to kind of fly to Mars. Mm -hmm. So the way that the kind of um, orbital mechanics work, the least amount of energy, the least amount of time happens when we launch about three to four months before this close approach, and then arrive there about three or four months after. And that's the most efficient way to get to Mars and why we're launching now. So um, unprecedented in the history of Mars exploration, we had four missions originally planning to go this summer. Unfortunately, the European uh, rover from ESA, um, the Rosalind Franklin was gonna go and uh, drill for organic materials, but due to delays with the um, COVID pandemic, they weren't able to meet the very tight astronomical um, limits of launching this year. So that's been postponed to the 2022 timeframe. But we still have three missions uh, from three different countries that are gonna be launching um, hopefully this summer. The US is sending the Perseverance rover, uh, also called Mars 2020, that will be launching by the end of July. Um, the China is sending their first uh, lander to Mars. Uh, it'll be an orbiter to kind of pick out their favorite landing sites as well as a lander, which will then have a rover. The first time ever a mission will have all three components in a single spacecraft. Um, that's supposed to be launching in the next few weeks, depending on weather and a few other concerns. Uh, and then the UAE is launching a uh, mission called HOPE that is going to be their first mission to Mars and try to understand the climate history and atmospheres of the red planet. So um, hopefully all these missions will be reaching Mars early 2021 and provide unprecedented international um, kind of exploration and views of the planet. So even though each one is a different nation kind of working separately, uh, we'll have this uh, three different nations provide data, uh, hopefully at the same time. So now we're gonna talk about this context of what do we know about Mars? How have we actually explored it? And how does it lead us to these missions? Um, so we're gonna go all the way back in time to early human history. Uh, for most of human history, Mars was just a point of light in the night sky, something that we looked up and kind of mapped out with the other stars and planets and realized it moved a bit differently, it had a reddish hue and would travel um, kind of in a strange pattern amongst the kind of more um, uh, fixed stars. And so uh, Mars, along with the other planets, the visible planets, Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, they moved in a kind of a strange looping pattern across the sky called wanderers and uh, that led to our Greek word for plant, um, from the Greek to planet and the word we call it today. And so this was kind of our knowledge of Mars, understanding its place in the sky um, up until the mid 1600s when we finally had telescopes to turn the point of Mars into um, the first steps of a planet. And so um, one of the first sketches of a feature on Mars was in 1659 by Kristen Huygens to draw this little triangle feature. 
So as Mars came close, these every two year kind of close approaches, um, telescopes would start for, um, focusing on Mars and start to see more features and sketch them out. And so if you had a telescope and you looked at it in October, looked at Mars in October, you can actually see features like this. So even in a small telescope in a, small, a dark area, uh, you start to see features like this um, in a small telescope that they're probably drawing. Um, you can see a dark feature, you know, it's not quite clear from this resolution whether or not it's a, you know, maybe it's a volcano, a large scale volcano, or it's a uh, possibly an ocean, if this is all you have to go for. So there's still questions about what this was, but they started understanding and identifying features of the planet. Uh, we saw possibly polar caps too, uh, making Mars feel a bit more Earth-like than an uh, alien planet might otherwise be. So uh, year after uh, every two years for uh, a few centuries, from the 1600s to 1800s, um, scientists around the world would observe Mars and start to draw features. Um, some of these would show some more lineations, um, channels in the Schiaparelli, an Italian astronomer. This was translated and seen as canals, which has a distinctly uh, human kind of uh, uh, intelligent life kind of connotation. Um, and around this time, we saw Earth, uh, Mars as like another planet, an extended planet that possibly was Earth-like in a place that was habitable. Maybe the, you know the polar caps of Mars uh, fed a Earth-like planet. An Earth, um, Earth-like planet had you know, polar caps here. Maybe the dark parts were oceans. Maybe there were forests, cities, possibly life that could even be building these canals to survive. Um, this kind of thought of life on Mars led to, you know, fictional accounts like Lord, uh, War of the Worlds, where possibly aliens might invade the Earth. And so there is a, still the sense of, um, you know, the idea that uh, aliens on Mars were dangerous um, was definitely a bit of science fiction. But the idea that life could be on Mars was firmly a possibility for what scientists were searching for when we wanted to understand the Red Planet. And so this began to change when we could finally go there and look for it. So in the middle of the space race in 1965, we had our first ever images, uh, close-up images of another planet with the Mariner 4 um, flyby mission. It would fly by uh, Mars, take some of the first photos of the planet the surface and send them back. And so this was the first ever turn photo of Mars of him as it's flying by. Not very clear, but uh, during the flyby, we had 21 other images and um, we got uh, higher resolution ones, kind of like this one here, uh, that showed impact craters. And this was kind of shocking at the moment, because um, all of a sudden, impact craters, you know, you don't really see those throughout Earth. An Earth uh, planet is active and as wet as Earth, doesn't have a lot of impact craters to really see on the surface, uh, but the moon does. So this was the first evidence where Mars was more moon-like than Earth-like, um, which kind of changed how we viewed it for uh, life. And if you notice on this image here of Mars and kind of the location, these little white boxes of where these first 21 images are, um, if you know much about Mars, you know Olympus Mons, you can see in the center of this image, that wasn't images, the largest volcano on the planet was not images, the polar caps were not images, uh, Bals Marineris was not images. So um, this flyby showed us a very kind of small part of Mars and none of the features that we came to know to be iconic of the planet. And so, um, so much still laid ahead to explore on the Red Planet. Um, yeah, so the result of this first Mariner 4 mission is it kind of really shook our view. We no longer saw Mars as another living Earth in the same way. Um, but maybe even within a desert planet that could preserve craters, there could still be some Mac life there that um, could have excitement for. This is an image that I love from a um, National Geographic uh, article written by Carl Sagan in 1967. So he was trying to fit in life within the uh, concept of Mars that Mariner 4 created. Uh, sure, it was a desert, but maybe it was a desert like Arizona where life can still sometimes exist. Um, you could have you know, Mars cactus and Mars jackrabbits going around a desert world that's consistent with um, the craters that we saw. So a few years later in the mid seventies, we sent the Viking missions to actually land on the planet and see what was going down on the surface. Um, we, uh, the Vikings included an orbiter, so they used Mariner data to kind of understand some of the um, places to land, as well as using orbiter data from Viking itself, which uh, imaged the planet, try and find the safest places to land. Um, we couldn't really have much landing site control back in the 70s, so we needed a vast area that was flat, that was smooth, so we can land safely, uh, because you know, no matter how interesting the site is, 
um, a rover, a mission, a lander would be useless there if it crashes because it hits a hill or a mountain or a rock that's too big. Um, so this kind of sets up the uh, process of whenever we want to land on Mars, we must care about landing site safety as the number one factor. And so trying to um, get better landing abilities has been a critical part of understanding more interesting part of Mars. So eventually they found places that were safe in Utopia and Christy Nisha that the um, uh, landers could land safely, um, hopefully. So they sent down these kind of large scale layers to go and take the first ever images of the surface of Mars. And they found these. These are um, the first ever images from a landed uh, craft on Mars, and we found rocks. Um, so no, uh, none of these kind of macro scale life in this area. This is the most barren desert of deserts that we could imagine. Um, but we weren't really settled for just looking for images of large scale living things. We sent this little experiment that's diagrammed um, here to kind of do a life experiment where we could take um, some soil, add some nutrients, and see if some of the biological processes happen and measure the gases that might come off. Um, and now if we take this sort of uh, device and we put it anywhere in the world, so if you go to the Atacama Desert um, or Death Valley, places that look a lot like this as far as life is barren, if we start to actually look, uh, give nutrients to the soil on Earth, wherever we go, life starts to live. Like there's microbes in every part of Earth. So even though some places look like Mars on Earth, um, microbes are everywhere. So we were hoping the same thing happened for Mars, but it turned out that uh, this experiment didn't work uh, or it didn't uh, result in any sort of science of life. And this kind of um, uh, put a NASA from exploring Mars for so long, because the whole idea is to go and find life, and that was the interesting part of the planet. Um, but now that we have evidence that it probably wasn't there, we stopped exploring for 20 years. 20 years we went by with not a single another mission to the Red Planet. Uh, this started changing in the 1990s. In the early 90s, we tried to send a really big mission to Mars to, as an orbiter to understand it, but that uh, uh, failed. Um, the early 90s saw a couple of failures and a, a big expensive mission to go back. And a lot of that's is because after gaining all the experience of landing on Mars in the 70s, uh, those scientists, those engineers all retired and we had to relearn this hard process of going to Mars. And so um, after a few big failures in the early 90s, they started with this idea of a um, uh, smaller, faster, better kind of concept for NASA of sending cheaper missions to relearn how to explore. And the first uh, successful one of this was the Mars Pathfinder with the Sojourner rover that landed in 1997. Um, it was just going to land down into Mars and produce this little rover to go around and kind of explore. Um, but scientists during these 20 years were not uh, stale. They had all this data from Viking, the orbiters to kind of understand the, uh, the planet. And when they looked from the orbit, they found evidence of water flowing on the surface. Um, and in a place, you can see this image here in the bottom middle, uh, you see these kind of channels flowing throughout the planet. Um, and here is where they decide to send Sojourner, uh, or the Pathfinder and Sojourner rover to go here. And they're hoping that these water flows would bring um, a mix of rocks from uh, upstream on Mars and could possibly see evidence of water here. But when they landed, they saw basically volcanic rocks. Um, you know, very interesting as far as understanding the composition of Martian volcanoes, uh, some possibly coatings, but for the most part, it found volcanic rocks. Um, and so this kind of idea from Viking of searching for life on Mars changed to this new era of searching for water. You know, we know on Earth, wherever there's water, there's life. See or evidence could be water on Mars. So we started this era of searching for water um, with every mission. So this rover showed that we can now land payloads again on the surface of Mars, um, but wasn't so conclusive in finding evidence of this past water. The next mission um, started in 1997. This was the Mars Global Surveyor, the first um, orbiter since Viking to actually um, observe the planet. And this returned high resolution images. We saw gullies, another place where there possibly was water moving. We saw uh, delta features, uh, places where water would have flown a long time ago. We could see the first um, dust devils, places where Mars was active today. Uh, we could see clouds and climates going on. We had um, a laser that allowed us to take topography of Mars, allowing us much better understanding of where to land. Um, that's where this vision of this kind of very flat, you can see the blue areas on the top of Mars, where it's very, very flat and much rougher, um, more older, therefore more cratered surfaces in the southern part. And so um, this kind of set the different terrains of Mars that we can start to explore and understand. 
This mission was followed up in 2001 by another um, mission to look at more compositional information, start to understand the elemental data, the mineral data, um, understanding the kind of what kind of rocks and materials make up the surface of Mars. And so this mission provided much more information about where we should want to land. So those kind of um, uh, learning of how to land the small rover or small um, lander with Pathfinder and um, Sojourner led to this desire to send a larger rover. This was the Mars Exploration Rovers. And we used the data from Mars Global Surveyor and Odyssey to understand where we should go. Um, so they two different strategies on where, to one, where they wanted to land. One was morphological. They went to Gusev Crater. Uh, you see at the bottom corner here, it's a large uh, crater that has this big channel into it. The idea was that this was once a lake. So if we land there, we should be able to find lake deposits and evidence of water in the past, possibly point to where life could be. Um, uh, this image over here where it says global mapping, that was a um, image from uh, survey, uh, sorry, from global surveyor as well as Mar Odyssey. That was a hematite, a big mineral signature. We saw no evidence of water there, but we saw minerals that indicate the water formed. And that is where we sent the opportunity rover. So one was sent for morphology and one sent for mineralogy. And both of these missions found um, stunning water um, evidence. The first one, the spirit landed, it landed in this big volcanic plain. So when it landed just on the crater floor, it found really nothing but dry volcanics. But then it drove over to this Columbia Hills complex and found these ancient terrains that popped up through the volcanics and allowed us to explore ancient Mars. They found silica deposits and possibly a hydrothermal system where we had volcanic heated uh, waters that then deposited and really became a place that um, could perhaps supported and preserved evidence of life. Unfortunately, the uh, Spirit rover stopped working before it was able to fully explore the site, and it didn't really have the right instruments to actually look for uh, evidence of life there, but this was a site that was a lot of interest to a lot of scientists. Um, when a Opportunity landed at Meridiani, they found these concretions um, when they first found um, land, and that should be concretions formed in water. I apparently um, took out the W there. But that was as soon as land, it found that there was evidence of vast amount of water in the area. And it spent years um, exploring the region, finding evidence of uh, depositional environments, uh, water flow to form regions, and even some uh, possible phyllosilicate alteration minerals that would have altered in warm, wet waters uh, towards the end of its mission. So this mission found, you know, when we say found water on Mars, this was where we found it in abundance on the surface. Then in 2006, kind of the main orbital workhorse of um, um, Mars science kind of came online, the Mars Reconnaissance Group. And this was a mission I worked on as a graduate student. I worked on the CRISM instrument, an instrument that used spectroscopy to understand the mineralogy, especially the alteration clay mineralogy of Mars, to understand where water was on the planet. And this had a high um, resolution imager, so we could see active Mars, see um, more dust devils, as well as see landslides happening. We could see um, you know, high resolution craters, um, seeing even images of the rover from space. Um, so this was a instrument that allowed us to understand the composition, the high resolution imaging, um, all these pieces of data that we needed to kind of target where images should land. Um, in the bottom corner here, we show how compared to previous um, uh, Mars Odyssey or MGS have like these Mars data, like you know, those um, the MGS, which kind of was the first mission to really orbit Mars uh, since the 70s. It had you know, 1,700 gigabits of data uh, compared to this uh, mission that had 34 terabytes um, of data that was just flooded us with a new understanding of what the planet had and all the resources and helped direct the landing site efforts. We then got to explore a bit of the polar um, <clears throat> polar areas of Mars with the Phoenix lander in 2008. Uh, we were able to dig in the surface and see a bit of ice. We were able to use LIDAR in the sky to see snow and understand that water in um, colder areas of Mars was very prevalent. Um, then in 2012, up until present, this science laboratory was uh, supposed to be the souped up rover, the next edition, where the two um, <clears throat> Spirit and Opportunity were looking for evidence of water. This was trying to take the next level, it was looking for habitability. Not only are there, could there be water, which we knew would be there, um, but could organic chemistry start to happen? So we sent a laboratory, instruments that could actually look for organic molecules, which was able to find and know that not only would life uh, water be here, but the basic chemistry of life could be, uh, but not quite the instruments to actually find uh, fossil life. And I'll get a bit more into that when we talk about the next generation of missions. 
Um, then in 2018, the last time we could go around Mars, uh, NASA sent the InSight lander. You know, after years of imaging the surface of Mars, they wanted to explore the interior. And um, this was a seismometer, a single seismometer that was going to listen to Mars quakes and try to understand what's going on inside Mars. So we understand the, um, the atmospheres of Mars, the um, climate, we understand the surface level of images, and now to understand the interior of Mars. Um, Along this time, ESA has been sending the Mars Express as well as the Trace Gas Orbiter to do another set of imaging to understand the, uh, they found possible water salt, salty lakes underneath Mars near the so, uh, uh, Southern Polar Cap and a lot of different features across the planet. So, uh, you know, as NASA has been dominating a lot of the Mars ex, uh, exploration, but there's been a very important contributions by um, the European uh, Space Agency to kind of um, explore in different wavelengths and different types of data that have helped us understand the red planet. So um, here's a little kind of summary of, um, you know, see so we see some of the different landing sites um, across the planet. So the idea here is that Mars has become incredibly well explored in this last 25 years, since the mid nineties when we've gone back. We see Spirit, Explorer, Phoenix up north, Viking, and this whole armada of satellites orbiting the planet and bringing back data. So, um, this constellation of missions of landers, rovers, orbiters have allowed us to understand the planet in great detail. And it is this kind of setting that sets the stage for what we want to do next on the red planet. So um, what is next? The next is this Perseverance rover and the process of sample return. So I want to talk a bit about what this mission will be and kind of why it came to be. And um, with all things humans do, there's a lot of politics that have gone into that. And talking about that is part of what this talk would be. Um, so why are we sending Perseverance and why are we actually doing a sample return? So to understand the motivation behind sample return for Mars and why this rover is happening, we're going to go back to about 2009. This is when Spirit and Opportunity were doing an incredibly successful job exploring the planet, transforming our understanding about the environments on the Mars. And everyone was getting excited about sending the Curiosity rover um, to launch in 2011 and land in 2012. And we were about to have a decadal survey. So the decadal survey, um, I'll talk a lot more in the next few slides, um, helps guide, it happens about every 10 years, and helps guide the uh, motivation for what NASA is gonna do. So with that kind of context, um, the decadal survey happened around the 2010 timeframe. It's kind of done at the request of NASA, done by the National Academy of Sciences and the National Research Council, a group of scientific experts to provide kind of the um, scientific community's recommendation on where they want to explore. And so this, I'm going to be talking about the planetary science group's uh, effort to do it, but um, astrophysics groups at NASA, they do a similar process, uh, and a few other organizations, in, um, kind of scientific interest groups do this to kind of tell NASA what the scientists wish they were doing. So the big things to remember here is that this is done by the community. They ask scientists to say, what do you want to do? And they try to compile that into what they recommend, the scientific community recommends NASA to do. It's non-binding, so NASA doesn't need to follow it. But if they don't kind of listen to it, there's a lot of questions about why. So, um, you know, sometimes a uh, presidential administration might say, hey, NASA, do this instead, and they'll probably follow the president's guideline. But if they don't have that strong direction, they try to follow the community um, scientists, scientific uh, consensus on what to do as much as possible. And the decadal survey is kind of the boiled down, you know, thousands of members of scientists and engineers, what do they want to do? So this is how they kind of rank that. So um, going into this, there was a Mars problem. Um, the big kind of thing you want um, to do for your science is a flagship mission. This is over a billion dollars. Curiosity was the flagship mission. Perseverance is now a flagship mission. So NASA, uh, Mars community wanted a flagship mission to go in this decade to kind of keep the momentum of exploring Mars. But the problem is we just saw all the missions that Mars had. So Mars has had a lot of missions. Um, and so it's really hard to kind of figure out um, what to do next like we can't just send um you know another uh mer rover like that's not interesting for the engineers at nasa to kind of create a production line of um incremental science that would kind of do the same thing but somewhere else uh so that doesn't fly at nasa which is a exploration and engineering firm more than a kind of production line scientific study place um and the problem with the decadal survey is all the planetary scientists is kind of competing at it 
So if we say we want to do a Mars mission, we have to say why that should be uh, flown rather than spending a few billion dollars to go to Europa or go to Enceladus or go to Neptune. All those different planets are targets for the same amount of money for this um, pot. So um, that was a problem is that we needed to have, we, they want, the Mars community wanted a mission, uh, but they needed something that would compete with places that we haven't explored at all. The thing that Mars did have is because we had so much, uh, so many missions in the past, we created a very large Mars community. So all these people wanted to, uh, you know, keep studying Mars. And so there was a lot of community support. And if that's where you're going for the decade of survey, a lot of people were writing in on why we should keep studying Mars. So Mars uh, community, and I say that very loosely, right? It's a lot of scientists working at universities, research centers, uh, even international folks who are part of the large Mars community trying to keep up Mars science into the next decade. So um, they had the strategy of what they needed to do. They needed to find a mission that was uh, interesting to national engineers, something with real problems to solve, something that would push beyond what Curiosity has done. And the science must be revolutionary. What can we do? You know, we can't just send another rover. We can't redo any of the missions we've done before, but somewhere else. How do we go to the next level? So the um, solution they came up with for this was the Mars sample return. The idea is that we do not have the technology to Early really understand present. Mars the way we want with any instrument we can send to Mars. So the only way to fundamentally understand something interesting on in Mars that's new is to go collect samples and bring it back. And now NASA likes this kind of concept because it gives them a lot of projects to do. They have to create a really good landing system to land targeted so they can find the perfect samples. They have to figure out how to collect samples. They have to figure out how to return those samples, launch it from the surface of their planet. Um, ISRU, how do we actually use the resources on Mars to launch something? Um, NASA likes that. It's the kind of innovation level that keeps NASA interested. Um, and the science, the idea here is that we are actually, after years, we haven't really looked for life on Mars since Viking. So it's um, over 30 uh, years ago, I guess, or no, 50, 50 years ago now, just about, that we've actually looked for life on Mars. Since then, we've looked for water, we looked for habitability, but we never looked for life. So we're going to actually have to look for actual evidence of life, uh, fossils of bacteria, what we're actually calling biosignatures is the term for a planet fossil of some sort on Mars. So that is the science that's gonna be revolutionary. We find evidence of life on Mars, that will really kind of change how we view um, life on Earth as well as life in the solar system. The problem with sample return is it's really hard. Even bringing back a small amount of samples, 100 grams of samples, for example, is like the minimum that's seen as worthwhile. It's going to cost about $10 billion to land on Mars, pick up samples, launch them, and return them to Earth. And NASA can't afford $10 billion on any mission in the course of a decade. Um, so any planet that's looking for money needs to kind of spend maybe two to three billion dollars over the course of a decade and so mars sample return they um, try to break down their strategy into three missions uh, one mission would go to mars land there pick up samples and that's what perseverance rover will be and then um, a next mission in another decade using another bunch of money from another decade will go there pick up those samples launch them into orbit the first time ever we launch something from the surface of mars and then another mission, even farther in the future, will pick them up, rendezvous in Mars orbit, grab those, and finally bring them back. So um, this is kind of a brilliant idea. So it's an idea that in this decade, we now have revolutionary science that NASA can do. We can fit it inside kind of a flag mission component. And um, also, it, once we kind of send this first piece, this first mission to collect samples, it doesn't commit NASA to actually returning them, but now with all this money sunk on Mars, it gives NASA a big incentive to keep sending at least two more missions to Mars before it puts focus on other planets. So uh, for Mars scientists, it's kind of a um, career guarantee that there will be Mar things to do on Mars for at least probably 30 years for these next two missions and at least $10 billion. And also it fixes, or at least for the time being, this problem that Viking had where Viking went, searched for life, and didn't find it, and nothing happened for 20 years. Now, we're gonna go look for evidence of life, but it'll be 30 years before these samples come back, and we can, you know, 30 years before the answer might be no. And that means scientists who are working today will be retired before they might have to stop working on Mars uh, because no more missions, because this is a negative result. So um, it kind of fits all these little strategies to kind of fit into the decadal survey. And because so many people in, um, in the community support Mars compared to you know, other 
interesting place just from the size of the community from past missions uh, there was a lot of support for this kind of plan and so when the decadal survey had their final results for recommendations uh, the first one was the sample return campaign to begin that and that would become this 2020 perseverance rover it's about to launch uh, the number two priority for the flagship missions was a detailed investigation of oceans in the outer solar system. This became the 2024 Europa Clipper that's um, uh, under works and should be launching in a few years. The third mission was to explore an ice giant planet. Uh, they suggested a Uranus um, orbiter and probe because it turned out the orbital mechanics is going to Neptune doesn't fit for a mission this year or in this decade. And so that one was not funded because of budget priorities went to the first two. And then the final one they recommended was to orbit Enceladus and Venus, and those were also not part of this past decade. Um, we are now in the very beginning processes of the new decade, um, decadal survey. So right now the scientists are writing their white papers, and in a couple of um, uh, months there will be another kind of uh, assessment of which missions will be prioritized for the next decade. So um, probably the second stage of the Mars sample return will probably be high in that. Um, and we'll see if giant ice planets and Enceladus, and Venus, all those ones might be reassessed to becoming more important now that these first few ones are underway. And so that's the history that kind of led to Mars sample return um, becoming the priority for NASA and why Perseverance Rover got the go ahead and several billion dollars to happen. So um, that uh, process made NASA want to do sample return as a major focus of its science. Now we're gonna talk a bit more about what it's gonna look like as the architecture. So the first part of it, uh, first of three missions is happening now as the Perseverance rover will go land, collect samples. And then uh, sometime later, this new mission will go pick up those samples and launch it from the surface of Earth for the first time ever, sorry, launch from the surface of Mars for the first time launching from another planet. Um, and then later on, even another mission will go pick it up in orbit, rendezvous, and then launch it back to Earth where we can finally study it. And so it's this three phase process is how sample return is mapped out to work. So right now, the first phase, uh, Perseverance is the only one that's really guaranteed to go, although we are into heavy uh, planning for phase two, um, although dates for that hasn't really been placed yet. Um, I believe we're kind of waiting to make sure that we collect good samples. You know. We can't do phase two until phase one works. So if Perseverance for some reason doesn't make it to Mars, then we would have to resend that one before phase two would happen. So um, before phase two becomes fully embedded in NASA's plan, phase one needs to cache the samples. So right now we're going to talk about Perseverance rover, what it's going to do, and what you might want to look at, and kind of like how we decided where to go pick up samples. So this is an image, um, uh, artist mock-up of the Perseverance rover, also uh, up until very recently known as Mars 2020. It is very much, it's built on the same platform as the Curiosity rover that's been roaming around Gale Crater since 2012, uh, but it has different instruments. Uh, Curiosity was designed as a science laboratory, so it had everything it needed there. It had um, all the kind of um, chemistry labs and instruments to do the science it had to do. This rover instead is designed to characterize uh, samples. It doesn't need to do these full analysis on board, it just needs to find them, put them in tubes, and store them to be returned. Um, so it's number one job to kind of get people excited this kind of science that's going to make or break the mission is we'll find life and uh, scientists call life biosignatures the signature of biology and you know a um in classical terms the most commonly thought like biosignature would be a fossil so if you ever seen a dinosaur fossil a skull of a tyrannosaurus rex that is a kind of most classic fossil you can imagine um, evidence that life once lived, looked like a dinosaur, died, preserved. On Mars, we don't really expect giant fossils like that to ever have formed. Uh, if they do, that'd be great, and we'd love to find them and return them, but we're not expecting that to be. Um, so astrobiologists have uh, uh, defined six different types of biosignatures that could also be uh, signs of life. Um, here we have macro structures and textures. This would be a lot like that dinosaur skull, a large uh, piece of rock or evidence that life was there. But they could also be very small, um, things that you need uh, microfossils, microtubes, biofilms, things that you need a microscope to see. So they're still physical fossils, but incredibly tiny and need different instruments to look at. But you could also have minerals, minerals that would only form in um, uh, life processes or organic uh, molecules that would only be formed by active life. 
uh, chemistry and isotopes are also kind of signatures that could be determined or created only by life. Now, one of the big problems with this is that um, depending on what kind of scientist you are, you don't believe any one of these alone. So if you saw, you know, if you saw a skull of something that was clearly something macro alive, dinosaur skull, yes, you would say that is a smoking gun, that life was there. But there's a lot of things that look like life could make it, but there's other abiotic life things that could cause it to happen. So we only saw organic molecules. There are um, non-life ways to create organic molecules. So if you just find that, that's not a smoking gun that it had to be alive. So the idea here is that you need some mixture of these to kind of have it confirm that life lived. Um, and the problem we have is that we don't have technology to send an, any single instrument to go to Mars to have detect any one of these. Uh, we can find some of these pretty well, but not with the confidence. And this is why sample return becomes so important because we want to bring back samples and have the best instruments we can find on Earth to look at all of these and try to find the combination that says, yes, this sample was alive, this is a biosignature, we know it was. Um, any instrument that we actually send to Mars would leave enough ambiguity that we wouldn't be confident with it. So these are the instruments that are going, uh, mass cam to get good images, rim facts to look under the surface, uh, spectrometers to understand the um, composition. Uh, one of the interesting ones I find is MOXIE. This is not really to understand the surface, but to um, uh, a demonstration to see if we can turn the atmosphere of Mars and pull out oxygen to use as rocket fuel. If this instrument works, we're going to send a much bigger one as part of that second phase of the sample return to create rocket fuel from the atmosphere itself and try to use the resources on Mars to help explore it. So if we can do that experiment here, that might revolutionize the what we can do to explore Mars. So that's going to be really exciting. And so this mission, all these instruments are going to characterize surfaces, uh, rocks on the surface, and then put them in these little tubes here underneath the um, see this little cylinder full of tubes underneath the rover. And so that's all these instruments are designed to look at the surface, understand what's going on, and collect samples for later um, return. And so this is kind of shows how the kind of strategy for caching samples will look. Uh, these first uh, two solid lines, this would be the main mission where we go and do something kind of relatively close to the um, uh, landing site. And so this is where there's going to be a lot of uh, stress, right? So like once it lands, it wants to basically collect really good samples as fast as it can, because at any day the rover could break. It could have a, a, you know, a fuse fail, it could have a electronic breakdown, a communication problem, it could have a rover, a wheel that falls off, it could fall over. All these things would basically waste the $2 billion mission. Uh, but once it sets that first cache, the first good samples, it puts them down, um, puts those away for the surface, then you know, a mission, if the rover fails, perseverance fails, that's not mission critical because it now has the samples. We can go collect them and do the sample return. But putting that first cache down is going to be a very um, a strong goal that the mission has to do before it can really explore more. So there's a lot of strategies for how it's going to work on the surface. So once you get that first kind of mission success samples down, and then it has years and years and years to um, drive, explore more areas, find better samples, and possibly return and drop them off. Uh, NASA is trying to figure out ways where it can put multiple caches across the surface so we can pick up either the best one or pick them all up. So that's all possible ways in the future. But getting that first cache down before the rover fails is going to be a very um, stressful time. And then it'll have more time to kind of figure out where to go to get the best samples and extend the mission. So um, with that in mind, we're going to explore the type of places that can actually land on Mars. So when we're looking for life, um, every site needs to have four things. It needs to be a place where life can develop as where, as far as we know it, we're you know, fundamentally have to look at life as we know it. Uh, life as we don't know it could be anywhere, so it's hard to really define strategies for finding it. But life as we know it needs water, energy, protection so it can grow, chemical energy for it to eat and survive. So a place for life to develop. Then it needs some method of concentration. You know, if we just have a few cells doing an independent thing, it won't really create a signature that'll be easy to find. So some method for concentrating life. Uh, then we need a method to preserve it so that way cells and microbes that may have lived billions of years ago could be still have evidence and biosignatures for us to find today. And then finally, we need some sort of landform detectability. So when we're looking at the planet from the orbit, we say, hey, this is where we should go. So any site we go needs to have um, all four of those to some degree 
And depending on what environment we go, they'll be better for one or another. So there are basically three types of places that keep coming to the top of the list of sites that we go for. Uh, deep, crystal, uh, deep crustal hydrothermal. This would be deep underground on Mars where it was warm and wet and protected that has since been eroded to the surface and exposed. Uh, second one would be a sedimentary lake or delta where there was water flowing as well as a lot of sediments to preserve life. And finally, a volcanic hydrothermal site that could um, have high energy waters that could support life and then preserve it in the mineralities that form from the waters. So um, these environments will kind of talk through uh, kind of examples as um, uh, we go along. So we've had four different landing site workshops for Perseverance and a few more for Curiosity where we spent years using orbital data to kind of figure out where these planet, uh, missions should go. So first um, we got these maps of Mars kind of saying where we can't go. Uh, the 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, if we go north of that or south of that, uh, the year gets too cold, the rover uh, mechanics the engineering doesn't really work well in those cold winters that it would face there. So we got to stay near the equator. So even though it's, it's a nuclear powered rover, um, it has to stay someplace warm so that way the wheels can roll and it can stay without stressing. It also, because it's landing partly with a parachute, it needs enough air um, uh, to slow down enough. So these areas that are blacked out, those are places where elevations are over 500 meters tall from the kind of dame of Mars. And there's not enough air above those places for parachutes to work. So it can't land in the places in the equator that are blacked out. It also can't land in these kind of white and gray areas because they are too dusty and we don't really know what the mineralogy is and we don't believe we can have a good um, capturing samples there because there's too much dust to get in our way. So the places where are available to land are all these kind of blue and green colored areas which show elevation that are between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. So in that area, we can start to look at landing sites. Um, on top of that, we also have this problem with planetary protection. So we're looking for fossil life, but if there are places where life could be today, we're a little too afraid of contaminating it. Uh, lucky for us, this isn't really an issue. Most of these areas that have problems with planetary protection are either too high or too far north or whatever, um, too close to where we have ice and water. So they're not really an issue that we really had to deal with for the kind of finalist sites that we had to learn from. But it is something to, um, that we considered. So dozens of sites um, that fit within these areas uh, were suggested. Um, I submitted my favorite, which is a hydrothermal system that I discovered in my graduate work. Um, a great place, I think, for finding life, but it didn't hit the other parts of the mission as well. Um, and so scientists suggested their sites, and then we debated and talked about it and spent years at these workshop uh, building up the kind of list. So this shows kind of the results of the first workshop outcome. Um, you know, a few dozen sites here listed and how safe they are to land. So we first, we um, anyone can really suggest a site and say, this is cool because of science. And then we have to find it, first figure out if the rover could actually land anywhere close. So some of them were better for landing than others. And we kind of ranked them uh, for which ones were easier to land. But more importantly, which ones had great science. So this was a table here showing the top um, the sites. And then we uh, scientific community uh, members went to these meetings, basically voted. And this show where the community uh, was feeling about how these sites were for scientific value. Were they good for characterizing the geological history of Mars? Did they have ancient habitats, biosignature, preservation, astrobiological qualities? So um, experts in the field kind of put these kind of votings in to create these rankings. And um, for the most part, the uh, high ranking ones by community would float to the top and then the ones below would kind of be cut off. So each meeting kind of we go through this kind of down select process. So after all these missions, 21 different spots were suggested early in the process. Uh, eventually we got down to eight. Um, this kind of shows kind of the imaging process at these areas, Columbia Hills, Jezero, Northeast Sirtis were the kind of top ones. And then um, perennial favorites of Holden, Eberswaldi, which were really great Delta features for lakes. Um, Marth, which is the old terrains, uh, Mellis, which was a uh, in the Valles Mineris, and Neely Fosse, which has this alteration material. Uh, so those ones were all good, but they uh, kind of repeated these environments because um, I mentioned the three environments. Um, Columbia Hills was a hydro um, hydrothermal volcanic site. Jezero was this depositional lake place. And Northeast Sirtis was this ancient um, hydrothermal crustal environment. So those three environments were represented in the three finalists that we eventually talked to. They're listed up top here. So yeah, so Northeast Sirtis kind of um, here, Jezero crater nearby there, and Columbia Hills kind of far off. Um, 
or the three finalists that we eventually went down as representing these three major types of environments. So now we'll talk a bit more about each one of these finalists to understand the kind of trade-offs and how emissions would work there. Uh, Columbia Hills was a place where we explored already with the Spirit Rover. Spent years kind of getting to know the geology there. Um, and so we wanted to look at this Columbia Hills mentioned uh, area I mentioned uh, a few slides ago of Spirit. And here, this home plate feature uh, turned out to be a hydrothermal um, location, a place where volcanic activity would have heated up waters and um, uh, created hydro, uh, hydrated silica deposits, which is really great at preserving life. Um, so this was one of the final sites. And for a lot of people who worked on the site for years of Spirit, they loved the fact that they knew this site really well. So they knew what a mission here should do. Uh, Jezero Delta, this is a um, another one of the final sites. This was once a basin lake. Um, you can see here, this is a end of a um, kind of river that created a delta. The colors here are compositions. These are all altered minerals, foul silicates, things that show that Mars was once warm and wet and altered. And the same process that altered minerals are great for supporting bacteria and life and all that. So finding these um, minerals in a preservational delta environment is kind of the big reason why Jezero Delta was seen as selected above other deltas uh, around Mars. So here, this is uh, what Jezero would have looked like once upon a time. Um, this crater lake filled, you see Jezero uh, kind of features in this upper uh, image, and it would have filled up with water kind of flowing in, and um, as sediments came out, it would have deposited uh, clays and that would have preserved any organics that might be in there. So we see this like little model here on the bottom. Um, this is a system on Earth. Uh, delta structures are incredibly great at preservation. Uh, the small little clay particles are really good at kind of preserving, capturing whatever they find uh, in between them. Uh, because it's so small, it's hard to permeate. Um, you, know, you can't really get water once it kind of forms into rock. So it kind of was really good at preserving. Um, these are delta structures that we find in the geological record on Earth. They're often drilled for oil because they're so good at preserving ancient life, which then becomes oil deposits. Um, you know, we see a delta feature on Earth of kind of what they look like here to show like this is what the environment would have looked like before it was fossilized into what it is today. Um, so we see this Jezero crater. Uh, we'd want to land just to the south of it into this deep part of the lake uh, where the best deposits would be. Uh, collect some of those, hopefully organic molecules, anything that might have been in the column of the water would be collected there, and then go explore the delta. Uh, here is a kind of zoomed out version of the lake. So you see in the bottom corner, this little white circle, that is uh, Jezero Lake. And um, this shows the kind of catchment area where the water would come from that would flow into the lake. And uh, all these colors just mean that the geology is really interesting. Uh, a lot of hydrothermal activity, um, and just a lot of stuff going on, and all that would be transported. So if life happened anywhere there, which we know could be habitable because we know the minerals form in warm, wet conditions, that would be preserved in the lakes. So that's why we'd want to go to Jezero. And the third site is just to the south. So see Jezero here, uh, just to the southwest of it is Northeast Sirtis. So rather than going into where all of this crust would be preserved in a lake, uh, Northeast Sirtis would take us to where all of this would be formed. So if we wanted to know where life was forming, this would probably be the place. This is deep crustal kind of exhumed kind of trains on Mars. So those three sites were considered the kind of lead um, uh, three finalists. So Columbia Hills, the you know pro of that is we explored it by spirit. So we know exactly what samples we want to collect. The problem with that is that, you know, we spent years exploring it. Mars is a big place. Why do we want to send the next 30 years uh, studying a place we've already been? Um, but the special interest group that I was fighting for are people who were part of that study. You know, they spent years writing papers about that, and they really want their work to kind of inform the next 30 years of um, exploring. So there was a passionate group of folks who, you know, spent years exploring that place and wanted to keep working it. Uh, Jezero Basin, uh, it was great for preserving. So one of the best places for actually preserving organics. Uh, diverse minerals showed that there was a lot of stuff going on. We can explore deep history of Mars in this one place. The big problem with um, this basin is that if we do find life here, it probably flowed in from somewhere else. So we don't really have the context for where life would form. Uh, the special interest here is that for years, we've been following water around Mars. So there's a large community who spent their career studying uh, deltas on Earth, sedimentary features across Earth and Mars, and they want their work to be relevant. If we went to a site that didn't include sedimentary features, um, 
a lot of their past work wouldn't be as relevant and they would have harder again um, showing their value for the submission. So a lot of people wanted to kind of continue that process. Uh, Northeast Sirius, the great thing here is we're looking at probably the best example of ancient Mars uh, and some of the oldest rocks on Mars to understand what early planets look like. Uh, this also could look us, help us look at the early Earth. On Earth, most rocks have been eroded or gone because of how active the Earth is. Uh, but understanding the earliest kind of time, the earliest rocks on a planet on Mars might help us understand how life would have formed on Earth as well. Uh, the problem here is just what processes would preserve life. We're never quite as clear how we know to know it when we see it. Uh, Spectroscopists would love this area, though, because they've been searching for these minerals across Mars for decades. And this is some of the best area to kind of finally dive into those minerals. So after the final voting um, and a lot of consideration and finally a decision by top leaders at NASA, um, they decided to do a hybrid. We're gonna to go to Jezero Basin because of the preservation material, because of community support, but we're gonna try and fit in a bit of the Northeast Sirtis terrain as an extended mission. So um, this is where Jezero Delta is where Perseverance is going to land in um, uh, next year, in 2021. It's gonna land somewhere around where this white circle is, start to look at the um, deep delta, deep uh, lake deposits, go up the um, delta and pass the kind of um, source of the waters for the lake. So this shows kind of the drive. So um, on the, uh, I guess my right, the upper ellipse is um, the delta feature. So that's where it's going to land in that ellipse. And then it's going to get its first samples there. And then it's going to try this long traverse. It doesn't know which way it's going to go. There's all these little places that we've um, been mapped already and try to go to this midway um, character. It's it's uh, The Northeast surface would be much farther away. We could never drive there in a couple of years. But in a couple of years of concerted driving, we can get to this place called Midway and get much of the geology, the interest parts of Northeast Sirtis in this kind of compromise. So that will be the eventual mission plan of Perseverance. The primary mission is just rural basin and then the extended mission going towards this Highlands um, uh, Midway site. So a bit about what this mission will look like. So as we um, uh, once it lands, you have a sense of what to look for. You know, we're going to land somewhere near this delta. Uh, try to drive as close as we can to get as, you know, the first samples we want to collect as fast as we can so we know that they're good in case anything, help ha anything else happens. Um, you know, a lot of this will depend on where in this ellipse because we can land anywhere in this ellipse statistically. Um, we're going to probably be, we'll be aiming towards the center of it, but, uh, you know, as we, um, there's a lower probability as we go out, but statistically anywhere in this white circle we can land. And then uh, they already identified where they'd like to start collecting samples and what they might look like. Uh, for example, just using orbital data, they want to collect you know, mythic floor samples to understand the, the volcanic history of the area. They want to have some um, uh, distal lake deposits. Possibly that's where we might find organic minerals, our organic molecules, and possibly the biosignatures. We have you know, port, point bars to understand the sedimentology of the depositions and a whole um, already from orbit. They have a good sense of where they want to pick up samples and start to create these caches. After that kind of primary mission, maybe a year into um, after we land, it will uh, kind of stow those samples in a safe spot and begin this drive into much more complicated, diverse terrain um, towards the mid midway kind of ellipse. Uh, luckily, we have these prism data that shows us from orbit what minerals we're going to be encountering, and that allows us to map where we want to go and what kind of samples we might want to collect. Uh, and eventually, we'll get to the midway area, which has this kind of ancient terrain of Mars, and really understand how Mars would have formed and possibly uh, the terrain where life might have been in. Um, and all told, here is a possible mission cache from Jezero samples, from the Traverse, as well as finally at that midway area. Um, different clays, different alteration things to understand how Mars would evolve. And they're hoping that somewhere in these samples is this kind of smoking gun of biosignatures that when they come back, we can finally analyze. So after those are collected, this next mission will hopefully go in the next decade, uh, grab these samples somehow, which they still haven't figured. I think it will often depend on how the samples are collected, how many caches we have to go pick up. And then hopefully we're able to turn uh, atmosphere on Mars and the rocket fuel, launch those in the orbit, and hopefully uh, bring them back. And so, you know, that's a lot of Mars history in this talk and a bit of what we're hoping to go find in the next few years of exploring this delta and ancient crust of Mars. Um, 
this was a nice little kind of demo, uh, a single diagram of this complicated process that ESA actually put out because there's talks of ESA partnering in future processes. So here we have this first one, the Mars 2020 mission. It's going to actually launch this rover to Mars. This is what is guaranteed to happen this month. Um, and then the next mission will go and pick it up. And this is where ESA is actually offering, um, proposing to possibly help as part of a fetch rover, helping with that. Um, and in this proposal by ESA, they might even help launch the kind of return mission um, as a way to maybe partner more with the analysis of samples down the line. But I just like this general diagram of these three different missions and kind of how they're moving around Earth and Mars to have this complicated process to bring samples back. And so with, um, you know, in this kind of history of Mars from small journey rover to hopefully someday human exploration, we are in this stage of um, with the Perseverance rover. So with that, uh, my talk is done and I am open to any questions that um, I have come along. That was wonderful. Thank you, JR. Um, so let's see, I have one question here, uh, one question here on the chat channel that came in. I'm just gonna, uh, let's see. So one question was, was there a different set of criteria in choosing the landing site for Perseverance versus Curiosity? What's changed? Uh, that's a great question. So um, the, so uh, the different the question was um, the difference between curiosity and perseverance uh, landing sites and um, you know the, the mission goal was different so in curiosity the goal was to land there and look for habitability um, so we were looking for a place that had these uh, right mix for habitability and we studied that uh, perseverance was to look for the next step look for samples we want to return um, so I would say fundamentally, a lot of discussions for the difference is not much. So we're essentially looking for places we can find life and that happened for both of them. But the big difference between the two missions is the multiple years we had in um, uh, between them. So uh, a major factor difference was we could land a lot better. So a lot of the sites that we were talking about for Perseverance, we just didn't have the technology to land at for Curiosity. For example, Jezero ranked really high for landing for uh, Curiosity, but it turned out there were too many rocks, too many boulders spread around, and the landing technology for Curiosity couldn't make it safe enough. However, by the time we got to Perseverance, they spent a lot of money and a lot of effort and a lot of engineering time learning to land on Mars better. So now we were able to shrink our, um, our lips so we had better understanding of the atmosphere on Mars, so we could shrink um, uh, our zone better, so we could target it better, so we don't need as big of a lip. So uh, Gale Crater was selected in part because it was safe enough to land, so we can land in a smaller area, get closer to the delta, uh, avoid some rocks. So shrinking our landing lips was a big difference, as well as we have what's called um, a range trigger. So we could, our uh, range trigger has allowed us to actually see the terrain, land in smaller lips, as well as avoid hazards. So if we see that we're aiming towards a big rock in Jezero, the rover has the ability to actually move around it. So we can land in much smaller areas. So I would say, the landing technology is probably the number one reason on why we went to Jezero now instead of going for Curiosity. Um, but other than that, you know, a lot of the same sites kind of percolated to the top for both. Um, Northeast Certus, because we were looking for more organic preservation for um, Curiosity, Northeast Certus was not seen as high, so that was just missed the cutoff for the finalists for the Curiosity. But when the kind of mission changed it for perseverance, uh, that would then became one of the highest priorities um, difference. So a lot of it was the same, but the engineering was probably the major difference between curiosity and perseverance. Okay, that's cool. Thank you. Uh, one comment that Marianne had, which is pretty cool, I didn't know this happened. Uh, apparently, NASA held a vote for naming the rover, and. Uh, Five, her five-year-old grandson and herself, uh, they both voted for Perseverance. So they're very excited that it's happening and it's actually got the name that they voted for. Uh, and then uh, I have a few more questions here. Um, they're rolling in now. Uh, do the private and public sectors divvy up which goals from the cattle survey uh, they will meet or do the sectors uh, not coordinate with each other? 
So uh, the Takedo survey, ha as it's been done in the past, is pretty much blind to the private uh, industry, as far as I can tell. Um, the way it works is they put a call out to the community, and the community mm -hmm. is very broad. So you have to write, um, anyone in the community can write a white paper, and then they get scientists to sign it. So um, there's nothing stopping the private sector for, as citizens of the world to write their own white papers. Um, I don't think that was a major factor in the last one in 2010. Um, the white papers are still being written, so I don't know if that'll be a factor in, two, in the new 2021. So maybe engineers at um, uh, SpaceX and those kind of folks are writing their own white papers right now saying why NASA planetary science should do their thing. Uh, but for the most part, planetary science uh, is, th there's very little commercial aspect of the planetary science part of NASA. Uh, the human spaceflight, that's where SpaceX and all these other private folks are in, trying to get humans in orbit, trying to even get humans to Mars. Uh, but human spaceflight is such a different part of NASA than planetary science. Um, you know, it might be someday they come together more in the future, but right now they're just kind of very separate. So, so far in the past decade of surveys, the private interests have just not been represented. Um, but again, that might change if... Um, there are certain technologies that the private uh, sectors are really interested in, and they want to push through this process. Okay. That's pretty cool. Um, Laurie has a question. When did Mars lose its water and how long was that after the planet formation? So um, losing the water is a interesting, uh, it's, a, it's one of those like really complex uh, questions, even though it sounds simple. Uh, Mars actually still is full of water. It's just mostly in the form of ice and water deep underground. So Mars didn't lose its water, it just changed form. Uh, so when we say lose its water, uh, I think what we're talking about is like, when did these rivers stop flowing? So the general idea of Mars is that 4 billion years ago, it was a pretty wet planet. That's when we see it's of um, kind of snow and snow melt and these basin formations and delta formations. Uh, probably around like 4.1 to probably 3.8. Um, in my mind's eye, I like to see Mars at around 4 billion years ago looking like Iceland today, a place that, um, you know, would have glaciers and volcanoes, but also rivers and lakes and all those things. Uh, and, you know, never tropical, but definitely something that's kind of familiar to us. Um, and then over the next few hundred million years from then, probably about 3.8 to about 3.2, 3.5 billion years, um, it would become much drier and become more episodically wet. So we do believe during that time we'd have oceans on Mars, but they'd be kind of an ocean that would kind of um, uh, kind of come up from the surface, kind of a big um, ice barrier under under the ground would be melted by a volcano. Big outflow channels would happen, cover the northern um, lowlands in some layer of an ocean, like a few hundred meters thick, which would then um, uh, sublimate into the atmosphere or turn into ice. And so we expect that to be kind of a periodic thing for a few hundred million years more. It was uh, the Italian for channel, which kind of meant any kind of linear feature. But then that was kind of badly translated into English as canal, which has a distinctly uh, intelligent aspect to it. And that was that miscommunication that led to this like um, kind of popular idea that there was intelligent life on Mars beyond or uh, beyond what the kind of observations were really showing. Anil is asking, actually he has two questions, not just one. Uh, so I'll start with the first part of the question. Um, if some life form, either bacteria or microbes are found on Mars, what's next? Um, okay, so yeah, I'm also reading the next one. So it's <laughs> it's this life <laughs> forms, what's next? Uh, and then if no life is there, uh, what's the next right. step? Yeah. So um, yeah, so this is a great question. Um, and there isn't really a good answer to that in my mind. Um, so, you know, uh, if you watch the news, SpaceX is determined to go to send humans to Mars. That's Elon Musk's uh, personal um, uh, passion and what he's building a company that is so far quite capable um, that they're gonna try and do. And people have asked him a lot, like if we find microbes on Mars, should Mars belong to the Martians and not to us? And he basically doesn't care. Um, he says those microbes are not going to stop his rockets, his people from landing on Mars. Um, and so unless we get the political will 
to decide nationally and internationally that Mars belongs to the Martians and we're not going to go, you'll probably have people like Musk, people with rockets who are going to do what they want to do. So um, that is, I think, from the reality side of it. Um, so if, you know, there is a chance that we find life and it revolutionizes uh, our view of it, if we're able to go, you know, it could be that we find it and it changes how humans view life in general. Maybe there's great um, interest in the medical community studying it and that creates funding to go and create Mars as a, a scientific preserve is a possibility, but I wouldn't hold my breath on that one personally. Um, and then if we don't find life, this is another good question. Um, if you ask a scientist, it's like, oh, well, we need to go to the other landing site because that is the one that really has it. Because scientists tend to just like to keep exploring it more and more and more. Um, and that's one of the reasons why this strategy was like a little sneaky where like we won't have a negative answer for at least 30 years. So that'll be the next generation's job to figure out motivations for why we need to keep exploring. Um, yeah, so those are just kind of the realities of finding it or not. Uh, and I hope they, I mean, you made a good point about uh, how we need to have some rules in place at in, uh, international level uh, before uh, somebody like claims that Mars is theirs or something like that. Uh, Masha has a question. Uh, Mars 2020 mission will not do any analysis at all or it will only send the samples. Like, is that the idea that it will only send the samples back and the samples will be analyzed in 10, 20 years after phase three is over? So um, I mentioned, I showed the kind of, um, uh, I showed the slides, or sorry, in the slides I showed the, um, the instruments on the uh, rover. And so there's a lot of analysis that the rover can do. It can take um, laser shots that can look at the elemental values to understand them. So the, you know, the, rather than really doing full analysis of like looking for biosignatures, its job is to more characterize. It wants to basically select the best samples. And that's what its instruments are designed first and foremost to do is to uh, characterize samples and understand which ones we should send back. But with that, there's a lot of analysis we can do. We can get the elemental data. We can look at spectroscopy to understand if there's organics. So all of these are a series of um, analyses that we can do in situ uh, beyond the kind of just collecting samples. And so collecting or characterizing samples, packaging them away, put them in the little tubes to return. That's like the main focus of sample return. But once that job is done, then it has these still very capable instruments. And as long as the rover lasts to keep exploring these areas. So um, again, it's not designed for the full loop analysis that Curiosity was designed for, but there's still a lot of science that these instruments are going to be doing for years and years and years. Uh, next question is by Gary, um, and so far my favorite one because it's engineering related. Um, can you show what sample tubes look like and how they work? Are samples collected by a scoop? Uh, how do you prevent cross-contamination between collected samples? Yeah, so um, I am not a sample, uh, the engineering expert on this, but um, here is kind of a diagram of kind of like uh, one of the things I've seen. Um, it shows these kind of tubes that, um, shows the rock samples. And so most of them are gonna be collected with a little drill, just like a few centimeters long. So the idea is it finds a rock, it characterizes it, and then uses this little drill, and it's able to put samples into these tubes, and then either take out the tubes and put them on the ground or store them inside um, the container. And um, I don't wanna to quote too much on that, but I know the key part is it's a drill to these tubes is the main kind of sample interaction part. Um, there was a lot of talk on like kind of reusing tubes, like you put a sample in a tube, you kick the sample out and then find like a later on you find a better sample. And so there's a bit of interaction on that, that um, there was a lot of debate on and I kind of forgot uh, where they settled on that. And some of that might be still possible based on how they drive the mission later on. Um, the key is they, you know, at any given time, they want to have the best samples possible. So they don't want to accidentally use up all their samples in the first week to then find the better one that they've filled up all the samples and they can't add more. So there's a lot of kind of processes, but the, the main part to answer the question is it goes from a drill to a kind of tube like this, which will then be left on the surface for eventual pickup. I see. Um, and that diagram is pretty neat, by the way. I mean, um, it it's a simple principle, but it's, it's nice to see it in action. 
Um, Marianne um, has a question for you. I love the idea of exploration and scientific discovery, but colonization makes me queasy. Lack of magnetic field protection, lack of much of an atmosphere, the percolator problem. So what's your take on that? So I'm definitely, um, I believe that a, a, a future where humans are beyond Earth is way more interesting than if we're just here. So um, I understand how hard colonization, or call it settling, um, personally, the humans settling Mars um, is the terminology I prefer to use. And I am a big proponent of it. I think the uh, solving those challenges will make us better. If we can figure out how to solve those things, we can solve anything, you know. Um, the climate change problem on Earth, I think, is trivial compared to how hard it is to get life living on Mars happily. So if we can come up with the will to do these things, humans can do anything. And that is a future in which I'm excited to be part of. Um, but as you mentioned, lack of magnetic field, uh, atmosphere, all those are going to be really hard. Um, but, you know, we use tools. We can uh, live underground. If we're underground, about, um, you know, if we put about a meter, half a meter of soil on the habitat, that is enough radiation protection to um, compensate for a lack of magnetic field. Um, and, you know, I think for any problem you can throw at us, human ingenuity can probably find a solution. Even if we don't have a solution today, um, there's probably some mix of it. And, you know, humans exploring Earth has been hard. We go to Antarctica and so many people die um, because of the challenges there, but new technology and new efforts, and we find a way to have outposts there. So um, I think it will be hard, but uh, personally, I think it's a more interesting future if we're solving these problems. Sounds good. Uh... I think that's all I have uh, questions wise. And once again, thank you so much for being here today or being wherever you are today and <laughs> and being online with us to give this talk. And hopefully we will, uh, once the rover is launched, uh, we can have another talk about how it went and uh, what interesting information you got from it. Uh, and very very hopefully in person next time <laughs> so thank you once again thank you jr thank you so much i saw another question just pop in so i can if you have oh, a moment did you? Well oh, yeah sure yeah so it's uh, how much cross talk sharing planning is there across the us china ue and european missions mm -hmm. um uh so you know some of those nations are not always on best of terms um and so it really depends on the mix of it. So the US and European, the ES, ESA and NASA, they often talk a lot, but they have very different incentives. Uh, your, the way Europe works is that they kind of have to divide their missions across all their member states. And then they work with NASA after that, because they need to keep their member states kind of engaged by giving them contracts and the right sign. And so um, there's a lot of desire to work between the US and Europe but the difference in nature of how those missions are um, developed and distributed makes communicate makes actually working together really hard. So usually it's where they each provide a piece of it and the pieces are kind of pushed together and that goes to explore. So it's uh, hard to really integrate beyond that. Um, that said, the Perseverance rover does have a few instruments that are provided by European scientists. I think RIMFAX and uh, possibly um, uh, the weather station where European uh, PIs, they created the instrument, they are building them with your ESA money, and then they're delivering for NASA. So there's a lot of partnerships like that, but it's still a NASA mission. Uh, but kind of high level integration of missions is always a little hard. Um, as you can imagine, China and NASA don't really talk much uh, for a lot of reasons. So those are kind of completely separate. Um, as far as I know, it's a UAE mission, Hope mission. There's not a lot of fish talk between NASA and UAE. But you, uh, they are bringing in a lot of scientists, a lot of the people who've been critical to launching instruments. And uh, I have a few friends who've worked on a lot of the instruments that have gone to Mars in the past, and they've been working with their um, UE uh, counterparts to kind of provide them the um, NASA experience uh, from the science point of view, as well as uh, engineering collaboration. So that one, um, it's definitely led by UAE. They're doing program management, they're doing all the lead engineering, but there's a lot of, um, uh, NASA resources and NASA experience that's making sure that they, you know, they don't have to start from scratch. They don't have to relearn the hard lessons that America learned when we lost so many missions. So that way they can, you know, hit the ground running and hopefully have a very successful mission that's like completely driven by their scientists without making the same mistakes that we've made in the past. 
So those are kind of how those nation relationships have kind of worked together. Got it. And there's one last question that just came in again by Laurie. Uh, is the major launch site in the dictator control Kazakhstan? Um, so for the American mission, that's launching from uh, Florida. Uh, whether or not Florida is controlled by a dictator is a different question. Um, <laughs> and so that's launching from American soil. And um, I can't, I think the Chinese mission is launching from uh, Chinese soil in uh, their kind of Western areas. I don't, I can't say where the UAE mission is. I forget where that one is launching from. So I don't want to quote think that it, one. I think this might be related to that, but, um, but that's, that's okay. I think, uh, I think that's what I got for you now. I think that's okay. Kind of Thank you questions. so much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you again for, the for your time. Yeah, no, no, definitely. It was a great talk. And like I said, we can do a follow up once it launches. So good luck with that. Thanks.